Sorry about my last name. I'm only known as Jimmy. If you call into the office and ask for anybody my last name, they will not know what you're talking about. If you say Jimmy, they will know that I am in the double locked door security room that I'm not sure yet is for my protection or Gen Pop. So, um, and since this is a community, I used to work with Keith, and he'll tell you it's probably for their protection. So, um, what I was asked to talk about today, so what do, what do I do at Blue, Blue Cross? Um, well, they call it cyber threat intelligence. Um, I like to consider it as a cyber intelligence. Um, we look at a lot of different information. So they asked me to come out here to talk about um, <clears throat> the intelligence information, what we share, and how we share it. And then at first I thought, Are they, I think they're trying to set me up to get fired again. Because like the first rule of Fight Club is, especially for the intel people, you don't. You just don't talk about those things. So I went to my team lead and I said, dude, what, um, what am I supposed to talk about? Because I can't talk TTP. Um, and he's like, we'll just keep it at a high level. So I'm going to speak to about intelligence from a very high level. I'm not going to get down into the weeds how I actually do it, what I do with it, and how I create my products, right? Or my collection process, where I get my collections from, and all of that other stuff. But I will give you an idea of the things that I look for on a regular basis. Um, how many people in this room are their company's Intel person? Because I know a lot of times you get double stacked. Okay, so one, two, so, so most, mostly no, okay. And, and the reason why I ask that is because intelligence is definitely its own language, okay? Even within the intelligence community, you can start talking about certain things. And there is keywords and vernacular that um, are used um, and if I say something and I'm not explaining myself correctly, I know I only have 50 minutes to get through this, please don't be afraid and raise your hand and ask me what I'm talking about because my wife explains to me that nine times out of ten I sound like Sheldon and nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about. So, okay, I'll take her word for it. She is the boss. So, um, when they put me back in the seat of cyber intelligence when we had a, when, when our new, um, CISO came in, um, they, they said, okay, Jimmy, uh, what are you going to do with intelligence? And I, I kind of scratched my head, and I was like, um, well, it's kind of been a train wreck for three years. Um, you know, we've had some wins and, and losses. I said, but really, a lot of things that intelligence has been asked to do is not really an intelligence function. And they said, well, what is intelligence function? I said, intelligence is about education, awareness, and enrichment. Okay, I am not here to manage your feeds. Do not ever ask me to manage your feeds. I can tell you about feeds, and I can rate the quality of feeds, but that is not my sole purpose. My purpose is to educate whoever the audience is, which is typically the, in the intelligence community, they'll call it the customer, right, to educate the customer, to make the customer aware of things, and to enrich their operation or process procedure, whatever, whatever that request is, right? They'll talk about a thing called a PIR, primary intelligence requirement. That will determine what you're going to collect, how you're going to make your product, who the audience is, and so on and so forth, right? So it's not to manage feeds. Another thing, too, um, so I do um, private research. Right? I'm always academically doing something on my free time. It's people do gaming or snowboarding like my son does. And um, I'm a lot like Egon from Ghostbusters. I collect spores, mold, and fungus. Um, that was a doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> fell flat. That's a tough crowd, tough crowd. Okay, um, so in my free time, I collect open source information and then I store it and correlate it and try to find um, relationships or um, unique things about things that are being reported by um, people like Unit 42 or Cisco Talos or independent researchers or, or, or uh, Twitter post or whatever it might be. One of the things um, years ago in healthcare, because I'm speaking, I guess you could say on behalf of my employer, we would always look at intelligence from the perspective of, well, it hit financial, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply to me. And over the years, my own personal research has led me to a different conclusion. I can support that. Um, so years ago, uh, if you can believe this, I was 30, 40 pounds lighter. Um, I may or may not have abused or abused certain substances. 
I was in the music business. I had hair down to the middle of my back, and the only thing I ever wanted to do was go on tour with Iron Maiden, right? So I, huh? Hell yeah, yeah. There's the man right there. He knows what I'm talking about. So in my research, I'm going to throw some names at you. Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Ozzy Osbourne, Iron Maiden, Mozart, B.B. King, Run, DMC, right? All artists. All very influential artists, too, by the way. So if you study music for any sort of period of time, you're going to find someone that you want to emulate. You are attracted to their creative solar spark or the way that they might manage their modes or use a pentatonic scale or um, the fact that they write more uh, symphonic ballads versus, you know, a blues riff using the one, four, five, right? I did that. And then at some point, I went, well, I really like the way B.B. King does this. I want to do it a different way. And I want to apply my own methodologies to his current, what you would consider to be musical achievements or musical research. And that's what's actually happening out there in the wild these days, right? You have things that are considered key indicators of maybe a certain actor group. But there's in, in, it's been going on now for so long that there's up-and-comers and then there's the pre-established, right? So if you have your old and your new, and the new always looks to the old to say, well, what have you done? What have you been successful with, right? So Lazarus Group, we all know it's a, you know, North Korea, this, that, and the other thing, whatever. There is a dearth of research on Lazarus Group that if I wanted to partner with certain coders or malware, malware writers or whoever on the underground, I could literally take Lazarus architecture attack architecture that's been posted by companies like FireEye and literally begin my own campaign and target healthcare with that same methodology. So where's the silos? That's not education, awareness, and enrichment, right? So I, wanted, I had to get that out. I, I haven't been on my soapbox in a while, but I, I, just, got, I just got done uh, at a conference uh, not too long ago, and it was a, um, I guess you could say an internal company conference, and I, I overheard somebody say, well, it's not in our silo. Okay, so um, today, in order, intelligence happens all at once, and typically it's going to involve the five W's. I was only asked to talk about two of those, which is the who, and, or the what, and the, and the, and the how, or, or the who, what, where, when, why, anyways. So we're going to go actually go a, a, across all of those, those five uh, areas, but first we're going to start with how it gets shared, because... I, because it happens all at once, there's a lot of things that get attached to pieces of information that an intelligence analyst will look at when they're appraising an artifact to understand how the artifact should be handled, right? The how. So the first thing, uh, has anybody ever heard of the traffic light protocol? Okay, so at almost half of you. So the traffic light protocol, then we're going to talk about how things might get shared on a, from technical systems, taxonomies. Taxonomies, anyone use taxonomies? Okay. So taxonomies, and then anal there's, there's a couple different analytical types that we do um, almost reflexively. Um, Brian is my counterpart at, at work, and reflexively we think in certain an analytical terms. Would you, would you not agree? No, no, Look, we, definitely. So one of the things that Brian and I have been working on is determining where's the line of delineation between these analytical types, right? System one versus system two. So what is traffic light protocol or TLP? It's a set of rules for sharing information. So it's a classification level, right? And who gets to see the data? Um, it determines uh, the scope of the share and the framework is freely available on US CERT. No yawning, please. <laughs> um, and this is just an example. I don't know how this came out, but this gives you an idea of uh, if it's red, right, you don't share it with anybody outside of the room, typically. If it's amber, you can typically share it within your organization. If it's green, you can share it across affiliates. And if it's white, it's fair game. A lot of times, you will get an email and it will say TLP Amber, right? The intelligence analyst at that point is now responsible for how that data moves across the wire. And, and when I mean across the wire, that can also mean from a, a human or a humant, however you want to pronounce that perspective, and we'll, we'll talk about that too, because in cyber intelligence, there's a couple of uh, key 
intelligence domains, right? You have mass int and sig int and geo int. Um, there's osint. There's humint. And those are, those are specific domains of uh, intelligence work, right? Um, the technical systems. So um, one of the things that people don't really, I, I think they kind of take it for granted is your firewalls, antivirus, IDS, if it's plugged into a feed, um, those are all actually sharing intelligence information, right? So you can get some intelligence information without having to make intelligence investments, um, like you know, intelligence platforms, simply on your traditional security products. Every time your antivirus updates, you're actually getting shared intelligence. We just don't really consider it that way because culturally, for the last 10 or 15 years, we've looked at intelligence in its own silo, but in, in, in reality, it started probably a little, a little more than half a decade ago where the antivirus companies started selling the concept of sharing their data with their customers when new information is found, right? So what is that? That's inherently that sharing. It's probably considered a mixture, a hybrid mixture of like TLP red and TLP amber. It's not, it's not gonna be green um, and it's definitely not gonna be white because it's proprietary information to them or they're gonna say that they have copyright on that discovery, right? Um, we share intelligence through emails. Um, those emails can contain uh, a wide range of things from um, qualitative reports to um, like just an advisory to uh, actual key indicators. Those emails might get stamped with TLP, um, text and VoIP. You're like, what do you mean text and VoIP? Yeah, so you ever been to uh, Slack? I'm pretty sure anybody in my sack is on Slack. That is a way, that is a technical system for sharing intelligence, right? Same with VoIP, you get on a call. Conferences, obviously I'm sharing intelligence while at Hall of You, my education and experience, um, publications, documents. And then you have your dedicated, what you would call intelligence-based systems that an intelligence analyst might use in the field, which would be like um, your, your FOSS, your free open source software, and then your COT, your commercial off the shelf. So Anomaly and TrueStar, would be um, examples of what a company could purchase to ingest intelligence or share intelligence from a COTS perspective. Um, MISP and CRITS would be examples of, and I have references to these things um, at the end of the slide deck. Uh, I don't know if these slides are gonna get shared out, but if you need the references, they're there. Um, those would be considered um, free open source. Right? So those are some of the technical ways that we would actually share intelligence. Um, taxonomies. I didn't know it, but years ago, I was struggling to explain to someone that the indicators of compromise that they're giving me did not have enough context. What I was really telling them was, I needed you to put something in a taxonomy. So. A taxonomy, right? Uh, who, who uses taxonomies? Sorry, I got these new bifocals. I'm, I'm, I'm that age now. Uh, individuals or groups looking to classify uh, informational artifacts. Uh, what are taxonomies? Agnostically, taxonomies are systems of data classification. Where are they used? Scientific data, biological, and any other form of practice that requires information to be classified within the confines of a hierarchical system. When are they used? Wherever data artifacts require classification and how are they used? From the viewpoint of intelligence work, we will classify events within a certain level of taxonomy or we will classify data with a certain level of taxonomy. And what I mean by that is I have an artifact. Okay, so what's the artifact? The artifact's a piece of malware. Okay, great. So that type of malware, is it a Trojan? Is it a downloader? Is it a whatever, I need, I need that classification. I need you to apply that taxonomy to tell me what kind of malware, because if I've never seen this malware before, I need to know where to start. And sometimes that could be nomenclature used by antivirus vendors, Powload, Emotets, Gan, Crab, yada, yada, yada. That's that vernacular I was talking about. <clears throat> and then these taxonomies also help from a research perspective because if you wanted to, you could then start to data mine on the taxonomies themselves, right? And you can start to try to find correlations between certain malware families. You can start to look for um, 
uh, metrics from a perspective of, well, FireEye said ransomware is big in, in, in healthcare. Okay, great. Well, I've classified 35 events, and out of those 35 events, a majority of them weren't ransomware. They were actually some sort of a downloader, right? Whether it was Powload, uh, Emotet, I think S-Load is another downloader, so on and so forth, right? So that's what I mean by taxonomy. So it's in, 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 in layman's terms, tags. What's, what's it tagged with? Okay, and then there's two, two types of analytics. Um, when, I, when I went back and when I, when I said, I am not your feed manager, I am not a manager of feeds. When someone like myself or someone like Brian goes and looks at data, the first thing we, we, we want to do is stop and think about the data, right? And, I, and I'll get to some of that in, in a, later on as we get down into some of the further things like kill chain, diamond model, and so on and so forth. So Brian and I will look at things. I, I hate to keep bringing you up, dude, but um, I love, I, we acquired Brian like six months ago, and I cannot tell you how r ridiculously happy because so, I have somebody now that kind of knows what I'm talking about, you know, and I don't get the glazed eye. And he's like, yeah, so you're really just talking about, uh, what was it the other day? He's like, how is that any different than uh, network, anal network link analysis? I'm like, it's not. He goes, oh, okay. And so, he, you know, the light bulb went on. Hey, he knows what the hell I'm talking about. Thank God. So system two, it's very slow. It's very methodical. It, it, it will look at data from several points of view. You'll do um, analysis of competing hypotheses. You'll do what if scenarios. You'll try to do some of the other complex algorithms um, like, uh, what is it, Bayesian, right, to see if there's a pattern in, in some of those things. And that, that, all of that stuff takes time to a degree. Even if you have a system of scripts or applications or whatnot, they're still going to have to, uh, if some of you use Splunk or Elk or, um, what is it, uh, Splunk, Elk, I can't think of this. I was just talking to uh, uh, Q Radar. Uh, you know, sometimes your search can take a while to get a return. So data analytics or system two thinking, depending on your, your amount of data or what you're asking to see from the data, can, can take some time. So just the whole process can be very slow. In fact, the research that I've conducted over the last year and a half using OSINT, I'm just now in a year and a half, I have enough data to show key indicators between certain types of malware and then shared indicators between certain types of malware with a certain level of certainty, right? So there needs to be a temporal aspect. And in and, and system two, you say, well, well, how long should I actually conduct this study? And, and, and that's something from a research perspective. And then there's system one. I got an indicator, knee-jerk reaction, it's gotta go out to the community, type up the email, tag it with the TLP, send, it's gone. I'm not thinking about it, right? So there's, there's a couple of ways in which we actually operate. And, and um, oh, geez, I don't know if I have this re reference. But this was actually developed by um, some of the folks at the CIA way back during World War II. They came in and said, wow, you're really kind of screwing this whole program up. And they, they, they came up with system one and system two thinking. So how we share also means how we're thinking about the data that we're actually going to share and what we're going to do with it before we actually share out the product. Okay, so what intelligence information? So, so we talked a little bit about the how, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about the what. Um, oh, we're good. So, uh, because most people are, are familiar with threat intelligence, I'll, I'm, I decided to kind of keep it um, in that vein, uh, but the, in, in my opinion, cyber intelligence, it, it can also be about um, political um, pieces, um, what's going on in a certain country, is that, does that ramp up the prospects of more malware coming out of that country because it's a whatever, it's in whatever state. I, I figured, you know what, I have no idea what, who, you know, what the skill level is of the audience, I'm just gonna keep it in the threat space. So from the threat space, we have, um, what we would share, we, we can, you can put that into a couple of different buckets. These are not all the buckets. Um, like internal proprietary stuff is not there. Like so if I reverse engineer something at work and then I get all of these artifacts out of it, whether it's through a sandbox or something like IDA or what have you, that's no longer OSINT 
based material, right? So, but the kill chain, let's talk about that box. So there's, there's the kill chain and diamond model. They're, they're taxonomies or, or systems to group information together and, and collect certain things, right? It gives you your PIRs. You, you know what you're going to be collecting. And then there's, there's, there's different types of collection or different types of intelligence. OSINT and HUMMIT, we'll, we'll go back to that because um, I know I mentioned that previously. Um, so the kill chain. The kill chain, uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the kill chain, right? Has anybody not heard of the kill chain? Okay, good. I can almost probably skip this slide, but we won't. Uh, so basically, the kill chain is a taxonomy system created by Lockheed Martin. Um, it's used to track atomic indicators for identification of possible threat actors and campaigns. <coughs> uh, example items that are tracked, IP addresses, hash values, domains, file names, registry keys, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the outputs from that collection go into the kill chain course of action kill chain course of action matrix. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, so that's new. All right, that's great. Okay, we're in Jimmy's world right now. I'm sorry, I don't talk this much, and usually if I do, I'm at a bar, and I'm probably drinking. Um, so, the kill chain, it's the what we share, right? We And it might be shared in, or it might be shared out, but those are going to be the types of types of data that get shared in and out, right? Atomic indicators from a kill chain perspective. There's a couple things you can do with that data. Um, you can take that data and you can keep that data and you can blend it with, let's say it's, it's information from an external entity and they're sending it to me and then I've, I've got my own kill chain bucket of data. We can then start to blend that together to, to find what's called key indicators of compromise. So just to say that you have an indicator of compromise does not mean that you necessarily have a, a, an identifiable, a, enough identifiable information to start to say there's a campaign happening against our company. Just because you got spam scanned does not mean there's a campaign going on, right? Just because you got a thousand friggin' phishing emails does not mean that you actually had a campaign going on. The key indicator is an indicator that's been seen more than once over a period of time. Now you set that period of time. Do you want to say it's six weeks? Six days, six minutes, I don't know. That, that's entirely up to you, right? But you take those key indicators and then, and then you say, now this, this, is, this is where the actor is. All of this other stuff is kind of like, I don't want to say noise, could be diversionary, like they'll spam you and say, oh yeah, go to google.com. Google well, I don't want google.com, I want something, whatever, uh, mail.ru. That's my key indicator that keeps coming in, right? And so then you start to reverse engineer all of that infrastructure using things that, you know, I don't know, you'd research the IP address to do the who has. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, and then you can identify the actor in campaign. Additionally, the kill chain course of action matrix says, okay, you got all this stuff. It's all in these little taxonomy buckets, uh, recon, weaponization, exploitation, uh, whatever. Um, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And that's an individual choice for every organization to make. I, one, of the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the key things that I, I constantly push back on um, at my organization or anywhere is do not ask me to tell you how to remediate this threat. I have no idea. I have no idea. That's not, that's not what I'm here for. That's for either incident response or security operations or policy development or whatever. I'm giving you the information, education, awareness, and enrichment. I can't stress that enough because as soon as you take me out of that role, I now become the incident responder, I now become the policy developer, I become the security engineer. Um, when am I going to have time to go back and do all of this other stuff because there's a lot of work to be done in intelligence? And then now I'm on the hook for several different items in the chain. What do we need all of these other teams for then at that point? So that's the kill chain. You can go and get it. Uh, Lockheed Martin's got tons of documentation. Lots of people, we do use it. Um, I use it in my own research to kind of get an idea um, of how a threat actor is working, which then leads me to this next piece, which is the diamond model. I, I do apologize. I've been looking for the last couple of weeks on where that came from, the diamond model, and I, I still can't find it. But um, yeah. That's that Sergio guy? Sweet. Okay. 
okay, great, I'll, 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 I'll do Sergio kind of diamond model and searching because I, I would really love to see the, the fundamental foundational work. I, I love history. I don't really track intelligence. And, uh, we have people at work that track the, um, the, the things that are happening right now. I love history because I want to, I wanna, there, there's a story that's being told there, right? Just seeing, and I, I read a great book when I was going through my graduate program um, that said this, the, the, all of our acronym agencies are so focused on the tactical that we have nobody anymore that writes about what it all means, right? So I love to put together those things. So I, liked, I love to understand the history of where something came from so that I can get an idea of what that person was thinking. So anyways, the diamond model, the difference between the diamond model and the kill chain from a, from a sharing perspective is that although the, the diamond model will have your um, indicators of compromise, right, from your kill chains, the diamond model also looks to do adversarial assessments and it also looks to uh, focus on the victim type, right? The kill chain doesn't really, when you get into sharing kill chain stuff, it's, I'm, and I'm sure you guys have gotten these things through either your Slack channels or whatever it might be, uh, bad IP, phishing, one eye and two, da 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 Okay, great. Pow, got it, buddy. So you have that, right? But at the same time, you're not taking that information and going, okay, well, how do I, how do I apply this to the adversary? What, what are, are they behind an Nginx proxy? Or what, what services are they using? If it's targeting you, what are, what are you as the victim? Are you a Windows shop? Are you a Linux shop? Are you an ad provider or healthcare or whatever? So the diamond model looks to expand on your, on your, on your, on your, on your kill chain items, right? And, and it asks you to make assessments. So from a, from a what I would share perspective is, um, an RFI It's a great example. Paige had asked me for an RFI one time on um, a certain set of indicators. So basically what she was asking me for was an assessment, right? And so that's basically the difference between the diamond model and the kill chain. And I created my product, my intelligence product, based off of things from the kill chain that was ingested, was an input from a, another team member to an output of a diamond model, right? So when you talk about what we share, there's a couple of different things. There's your, your, your little key indicators, right, that you, you load up in your SIM or whatever to assessments, to reports, to whatever, okay? Open source intelligence. So I'm bringing this up as a share, um, because it does get shared around a lot, um, I will be at, at, at day job um, and I'll get a link that says, uh, check this out, this is something new, it was reported by whatever news company. We, we actually, for as much as we say we need intelligence and there are companies that will tell you um, that they will provide that to you and it's, it's value added. <clears throat> Most of your RSS feeds are where they get your, their data from to begin with. It's all OSINT. It's all out there. It's just a matter of taking the time and this goes back to that vernacular and, 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 and whatnot as intelligence as a language. But you gotta know what keywords to put into your RSS feed in order to find the same stuff that these people are looking for and that takes time. I mean, <clears throat> you can't just take any security operations analysts and say, okay, b build me a feed. Okay, well, they have to watch the feeds first to understand what the language is gonna be even. I mean, some of our first level analysts, they came in and I said, listen, I, I really need you to look for S-load. They'll be like, how do you even spell that? E-S, no, right? <clears throat> so you can leverage uh, this from a collection source and then you can share it out, right? Um, and then the other way, the other what that we share, so we talked about kill chain, diamond model, and the OSINT, OSINT flies around a lot. Um, the, the humant or humant, right? Um, conversationally, we share a lot of data that we just don't really realize we're doing because we do it so naturally, right? So it goes back to that system one, um, how, right? The, the, the what is in the context of the dialogue. And we, we, you, you guys actually did it all day today. I observed, it was, it was kind of cool, I was gonna do a write-up. Um, but you guys actually shared a, 
a, a ton of intel today between each other. And you don't even really realize you're doing it, but that's actually what you did today. You, you got together and you told some dirty jokes and this, that, and the other thing and bitched about work and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, at the end of the day, you had conversations with people that you were interested in connecting with because you wanted to pick their brain. I do it all the time from, from that perspective. In fact, um, chewed out at my last conference because I wasn't at the conference enough. Well, I already knew all the technical stuff. I wasn't there for the technical stuff. I had a mission in mind. And there were specific people that I had to see at a specific time. I know this sounds very CIA, but they were doing their own thing, right? So they're in their talks or doing whatever, but it was critical to some of the things that I'm building at work that I met with those people. I had to share the intelligence, the things that were on my mind and the things that were on their mind. And so because we do it so naturally, we really don't, we really don't give it the value um, and we don't really recognize when we're doing it. It's very, it's very system one. So, so that's the what, right? Or that's the how, this is the what. And then the who and the when. Um, you know, <clears throat> I've been told several times, well, intelligence needs to do this. Really? You know, that's the first time I've ever talked to you as a customer. So prior to me wasting my time and yours, I have no idea what's on your mind. So when you talk about the who, the when, and the where, that's all very relationship specific, right? The U.S. CERT, when they send out their notification and all of a sudden, woo, there's a new vulnerability and everybody goes running to make sure what was the latest one or what was the one that just came out? Uh, RDP, something like that, whatever. Um, That came from an external entity that they don't really care about who the consumer is. They already kind of know that the consumer is probably somebody in security relations. So from an intelligence perspective, as an analyst, your who, what, where, when, why, and how are in constant, um, that's why I kind of drew it as a, I don't know, cross that's constantly doing this because I'm going to take data and get data and move data and receive data from external entities. I've got internal entities. I've got ad hoc sharing, which is system one. And then I've got scheduled sharing. And all of that is very, I cannot, I cannot come up here and tell you how to do that. Because I'm not at your organization. I don't know who your affiliates are. I don't know um, what your relationships are within your security groups. But what I can tell you is that, um, those, those, those are constantly happening. So when you're, when you're, when, if you're not an intelligence analyst and you're trying to figure out why your intelligence analyst is constantly at an AA meeting, it's probably because this is always happening all at once. That was another joke. No, tough crowd. Damn, those are tough. Um, but some examples of external entities might be your ISACs. Uh, you guys know about the ISACs? Yes, no, okay, ISACs. They're an external entity. Um, we talk to them all the time. Most organizations do. Um, it's one of the, the, big, the, the big things. Your, your, your VPs and your managers will be like, well, you got to get, get into your ISACs, your internal stuff. You know, it depends on who the customer is. That could be, um, right, uh, it could be your SOC analysts, your threat hunters. Um, policy and development could come through and ask for, you know, metrics on what, 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 what are the most relevant breaches of the day compared to, what we see internally, so that maybe they want to write a new policy. Scheduled sharing. <sighs> An example of scheduled sharing. So, right, uh, going back to your internal security systems, right? They update on a cron. There's, there's a certain timer that goes off. So that would, be, uh, that would be a concept of a scheduled sharing. When I do my own research and I, and I update certain uh, taxonomies in, in, my own, in my own systems, uh, that's on a cron, right? And so that'll all, uh, the, the sharing and distribution is also on a cron because that's just the way I determined it. I don't want to send out a bunch of individual emails uh, periodically throughout the day. I'm just going to send them all out at 6 a.m., right? Or, um, you know, your ad hoc sharing, that's, that goes back to the, the Slack channels. It could be scheduled. You could have a ad hoc scheduled to conference over Slack about, the RDP vulnerability and everybody agrees to it, but that's all I had to hock. So that is, the, that is primarily the who, what, where, when, why, and how of 
intelligence at a very high level without explaining any of my own personal TTP or systems or breaching my confidentiality agreements with my company and all of that stuff. So we have 20 minutes. Yes. Um, lose the clock. Uh, do, do we have any questions at all? Probably not. Oh, we have one. Okay, I'm surprised. So, right, so going back to education awareness and enrichment, it depends on the customer and how they like to run their, uh, run their show, right? Um, it goes back to that, uh, th that kill chain course of action matrix. You're, it, and it might even boil down to your skill sets in your shop, right? Like maybe you can only do detection and response and prevention just wouldn't work because it, I don't know, affects a certain application. You know, I've, I've worked at um, certain shops, not, not Blue Cross, where they wouldn't secure certain systems or respond to certain things primarily because, oh, well, let's just say the systems were too old to do anything about, right? So, um, but I get asks that are all over the map, man. Uh, I'll, I'll get asks, you know, hey, can you share me some engineering knowledge? You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to set up this, this application to, to track my own in intel. How did you build it? Right, and so it's so it really ranges. And this is where this is where I, I, I when originally I started the talk, I said I, I'm not really cool with the term cyber threat intelligence because I'll share out all kinds of stuff or ingest all kinds of stuff on a regular basis. And to me, because I've been doing it for the last four or five years, data becomes data, right? Like a lot of people are very focused on the, the what happens. With what I would consider to be in the threat hunting stock realm or like the security engineering, security architecture realm, you know, but I'm out in some wackadoo land. Um, so it, it all, to answer your question, it all depends on the customer, right? So it definitely all depends on the customer. Um, I knew this was going to come up. Uh, this is the part where 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 there's 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 a tightrope, and then there's a pit full of lions, and they haven't been eaten or fed in like a week. And now I've got to kind of like do this. <laughs> so yes, we have gotten to that point where we do um, create certain products or, or share intelligence out. Right. That goes back to though um, the who, what, where, when, why, how that cross of the different entities and then it goes back all the way up to the beginning of the slide deck of the of the how we share it the TLP TLP and taxonomy I can't I can't stress enough um, how important those things are right because in, in in those business agreements and business arrangements how important those things are right like if you have affiliates or subsidiaries and you've got certain business agreements and business arrangements that say it's okay to do this then whatever technical system or process you determine is easiest for your team to, to manage is how you're going to ultimately get that done, right? Um, so, but yes, we have gotten to that point, and we have certain things I've got. That, another reason why I like researching OSINT, because it doesn't really matter at that point, right? As long as I reference it, we're good to go. Um, but, yeah, we, we have gotten to that point. Anonymization helps a little bit. Um, I think that's where the – when I was saying the, the vendors – like the antivirus, they're kind of like this hybrid TLP because they got that sample from somewhere, <laughs> right? I mean, if it wasn't my shop, it was your shop. So, but they anonymize it, right? They don't tell you where it came from, just that they have this, this data. Are you working on a specific project that you're trying to get off the ground? Without getting you, you know, into the lion, lion pit. Better you than me, though. Which ones? Uh, the FOSS or the COTS? We're, we're probably waiting for the FOSS. Sweet. You need to talk to me. And, and Brett will tell you I am 
the worst person to talk to about it because I've been seeped in it for like three or four years now, and it's all I promote. Um, not to, to – I, I hate to get on my soapbox, but <clears throat> just giving me a billion friggin' indicators does not help me in a security operations center when the taxonomy tagging and context is still not there. It's still garbage. It's still garbage. If you can't relate it to something, or even, and this is something, um, if you can't even spend the time to make it something new, then I, I, don't, want, I don't want it. I just don't want it. I don't want it. Uh, I've gotten to a point where a million freaking indicators, if, you, if you're sitting on a warehouse, of a million friggin' indicators, and I gotta set the confidence level on ingest to 90 to 95% or higher, and you've got a million indicators, that means what, like 900,000 of them are garbage? What, what, I don't need that, that's not a selling point to me anymore. You know, when I, first, when I first started down this track, right, I wasn't always an intelligence analyst. I mean, obviously 20 years ago, I had nothing to do with computers. Uh, I just wanted to rock out. Um, I would have said to a vendor, wow, that's amazing. And now I actually vet vendors based on the OSINT that I find. I was just having this conversation with, I think the Palo Alto guy was here. Um, we were talking about uh, Unit 42. I said, uh, I now look at vendors for what they publish because I'm purchasing your skill set, not your tool. And if you can't display to me enough depth in research on a piece of malware or whatever, then I can't, I don't know if I can necessarily trust your product because what are you doing in the background, right? So um, I can get with you on some of my research for the, for the, um, for the FOSS stuff that, that, that I can do. Um, and I can tell you which ones work really well and which ones you don't even want to deal with because there are some that are just, they're garbage. No, I shouldn't say that, actually. That, that, was, actually, that was actually really foul of me. Um, they're just not um, as well supported as some of the other products, right? They're all great efforts. It's, anything that I've ever used FOSS is far and above and beyond anything I could produce on my own, period. So kudos to anybody that, that, that goes down that road. Um, anything else? Yeah. It's another good one. Um, so that goes back to the ad hoc and scheduled. Uh, it's really hard. Um, and it's really hard to put a process around something like that because eventually what happens is you'll be following the process and something's going to get stuck in the process. And then you're going to adjust the process only to realize that you needed to adjust it back to what you had. And it's just like this constant moving target. So what I try to do is I try to, I try to, I try to collect and prioritize. I try to give you... Ah, actually, Brian asked me that question uh, a long time ago. Um, he said, "He said, why is why is your research a lot of your research um, threat levels undefined?" It's because I'm not your organization. I don't know, right? So some of that comes back to your own org too, right? Like well, I don't know what your shop is, so I could give you a bunch of Linux information, but if you're not really a heavy Linux shop, then no matter where I prioritize it in the stack, it's just kind of irrelevant. So I try to, like in my own research, I collect um, what I might myopically think is a cool CVE. I collect uh, OSINT on threat actors. Um, I'll collect malware reports um, like from Talos or Unit 42 or uh, FireEye will sometimes do reports. And then I, I'll collect on data breaches. And I collect data breaches because I work in healthcare, right? Um, so it's just kind of like a natural, a natural fit. Um, and then what I try to do is I try to either do it in an ad hoc way. And what I mean by ad hoc is that I make the information available to you. One of the things we realized was that when I started doing the, the, the Intel work again, was that people were waiting for me to distribute the, the information. And I said, that's really kind of backwards because you don't know what I'm doing in the, in the middle of my day. I could be sick. I could be whatever, right? I could be working on something else entirely, and now the information is stopped at me. So if it comes in through an email, but it needs to be distributed out. So what I did is I kind of worked it backwards and said, no, I'm going to give you access to the systems that I use. 
and I'm going to put you on the mailing lists that I use. So you're not waiting for me. And so, like, um, Brett works on a completely different team. If he has access to the information, he can vet, then I'm, I'm now opening the information up to people, and then he can vet and prioritize what he thinks would be relevant to his role within the organization versus me trying to determine what he thinks is, is relevant, if that, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like a really backwards way to do it, like where most of the time you'll try to work a threat from like a high priority critical down to a, I'll get to it tomorrow because it's an informational type of alert where I, and, and a lot of it is, comes from big data too, right? I mean, uh, what's big data? Volume, velocity, and uh, what, diversity or something like that? And like, I'm inundated with data on a regular basis. And for me to try to figure out what, you know, like the vulnerability guys, that's easy. Prioritize that to the vulnerability guys, but give them, guys and gals, I should say, give them access to the things so that if they're sitting on their thumbs, they're not waiting for me to get done with working with the threat hunters on a malware report, right? So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but that, that's, that's kind of how I, it got to the point where I'm just like, ah, oh, I don't care anymore. Here, take it. Just take the data. You do it. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the customer is the one that's going to be reacting to the data, not me. Right? So if I can get it to them faster, I figured I was probably being more um, value added to the, to, the, to the organization as a whole, as opposed to you waiting for me to get, get it to you and figuring out what's important in your day. I'll tell you this, their skill sets at work, I have no idea what they're talking about. They're speaking a moon language, too. I'm like, oh, you know, so I'll let you figure that out. So I don't know if that helped. As uh, part of the threat and intel sharing, sure. do you ever do any part of your program about sharing, like, defensive or mitigation techniques that are coming up? So, <coughs> yes and no. So that goes back to... to um, I'm sorry, your name was? Ed. Ed. It goes kind of to Ed's answer. Um, yes and no. Uh, so sometimes when you consider education, awareness, and enrichment is, is in order to meet that strategic goal, is it better if I facilitate the communications and set up that infrastructure versus actually sending you that data. So kind of like your, your, your MySec um, Slack channel, right? You can go in there, uh, I'm making an assumption because I've never been there, I just OTS and you can see people on it, right? I'm assuming that you're not always talking about pizza and what you had for lunch, right? You're kind of like sharing whatever. So from an education awareness and enrichment, it behooved us organizationally and it's still something that we're working on internally. Um, to develop a channel that's specifically for um, security ops groups to share those things back and forth, right? Because I don't really, I mean, I can write Splunk code. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not like Andy, you know, or, or Brent or Brian or whatever. I'm, I, I can't spin that stuff up as well as they can, right? But if I can connect those two people, now I facilitate it in the sharing, right? So sometimes you have to look at the, the EAE strategic goal, is it better for me to consider what architecture or infrastructure is going to facilitate that sharing um, easier, or do I have to be the one to actually do the give and give and, give and take? Um, so, but yes, that's something, I, I think it's critical uh, and, um, to, to have that, um, and that goes back to the reflection of your threat actor, um, that whole thing, thing about the copycats I was talking about to your security operations centers, right? You have a mix of skill sets. You have somebody that's been there for a while that knows how to do everything. Because they know how to do everything, they don't necessarily always have time to teach the new people. The new, new people are struggling. It would be great if they could just plug into a channel and talk to someone, right? So yeah, we definitely are. Well, that, that's in the works. I can't tell you what it's called, but there's actually official documentation and, and there's lots of support for it. So, but because it's at a very, very, very high level across lots of orgs, right? Um, it takes a lot of time. We have to pilot it, proof of concept. Because that's a different kind of share too, right? When you start talking about intelligence analysts sharing with intelligence analysts or creating something for a customer, that's one thing. But when you start talking about 
teams now needing to communicate. Um, it almost because uh, do you know what do you know what an do you know what an AWAX is? Okay. An AWAX will talk to several different squadrons, and those squadrons have to work in conjunction with each other, and they use the AWAX as an intermediary. But they'll also talk squadron to squadron, and that's the kind of communication you're talking about when it comes to sharing like defensive techniques or stuff like that, because now you're talking about enriching a team versus an, a single intelligence person that might work for the organization, or, or you know, so, oh, I just they're doing they're doing this, so, but um, like Brian and and Brent and and and, and Paige and, and and Andy and stuff, I'm always available, jibber jabber, right? Some things I can obviously not not to be like CIA spook type thing. I can I can go so far and 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 and, and give you some of my conceptual thoughts of, of of those things. Yeah, but yeah, we're definitely doing that. Yeah, definitely. It's in fact I think it's I think it's critical. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's intel. That's what we do. How we share it. All right.